carry on until we're done. There's an important distinction to be made in terms of analysing article, uh, analysing the guidance, and whether it is or its issue is incompatible with convention rights. Because there's a difference between the guidance, uh, as the guidance that sits there, and decisions taken with regard to the guidance. Um, and that, it, in my submission, needs to be borne in mind throughout. Um, we uh, submit. In essence, the judge was right um, to find that the, the victim test was not satisfied um, and that there was no interference with the Article 10 one rights of Dr. Butt. Um, and we submit that he was right to find that even if there were, it was compatible with Article 22 originally. Um, his findings in relation to victim status and the impact of the guidance in our submission of our findings of fact and the evidence before them. Um, so this is at paragraphs um, 75 to 90 in particular of the judgment. Yeah, 75 to 90. 75 to 90 where he deals with victim status. Yes. judge found, as a fact, there was no evidence of invitations being withheld from Dr. Butt or withdrawn from Dr. Butt as a result of the guidance, <coughs> and that had this happened, uh, Dr. Butt would know about it. Um, and the particular references in the judgment um, where this is dealt with are paragraphs 51, 72 to 73, 81, 87, 91, and finally 152 to 155. <coughs> so the, the, the Dr. Watt's own evidence as to a diminution of his in his getting invitations was that that was the impact of the press release and of him self-censoring um, and it wasn't uh, it, the judge found it wasn't to do with the, the guidance or any particular provision in the guidance um, in our submission the judge was right to find that compatibility with article 10 of any refusal arrived at by reference to the guidance can only be just determined on the facts of the particular case. Um, so one would have to look at what was the content of the particular speech or event, what were the institution's policies, um, what were the surrounding circumstances in the context, what was the proposed mitigation, what was the response to the proposed mitigation, what were the discussions between the institution and those wanting to hold uh, the event, and what were the reasons for refusal. Um, whether or not any refusal um, made by, uh, of, an, of permission to proceed made um, by reference to the guidance is, is incompatible with Article 10 can only be assessed on the facts of a given case. It's not possible to say the guidance in and of itself is incompatible with Article 10. Um, we say that the my learned friend's submissions about the risk of refusal is not sufficient and that the judge was right to find that. Um, the guidance doesn't involve um, investigation or prosecution. There's no sanction um, entailed with the guidance. Um, and the, the cases relied on by my learned friend to say, well, he may be a potential victim. But again, all cases to do with secret surveillance and interception of communications. So where um, the Strasbourg Court has um, has moderated the victim test in order to allow claims to proceed. 
Um, and the judge in this case found that if Dr. Butt had ever been uh, had an invitation withdrawn, he would know about it. He would be able to bring his his claim. Um, there's no there's no scope for applying a moderated victim test on the basis of potentially being a victim. That only arises in um, cases following on from class in Germany, uh, Kennedy, Zakharov, Jabba and Vishnu and so on. The, the judge also rejected and this is again a fine finding effect, the, the suggestion that the guidance in and of itself produces a chilling effect. And I'll come to, well, supposing it did have a chilling effect, what, what would be the relevance of that? But just in relation to whether it did or not, um, he was very critical of the evidence relied upon um, the, the anti-prevent evidence relied upon by the claimant. Um, the, the parts of, of his judgment that are, are relevant are, and I'll just give, give your lordship's relationship, the paragraph numbers are 72 to 76, 80, 87, 89, 130 to 131, and 152. So there was simply no evidence <coughs> of the guidance in and of itself uh, creating problems or having an adverse impact on um, free speech in universities. Uh, and Dr. Butt certainly wasn't a victim of, of any interference with his freedom of expression rights. But st standing back from that, it, in my submission, it's important to bear in mind um, and to be realistic about what is what is in fact said in the claimant's evidence, the rejected evidence, about chilling effect. The concerns that are expressed in that evidence are none of them concerns about the guidance, they're all concerns about the prevent strategy. Now, the, the prevent duty exists and applies as a matter of primary legislation. There will be prevent duty guidance relevant to external speakers on universities in place. Um, and one has to ask, well, to what extent does this guidance, given its wording, increase the chilling effect, if there is a chilling effect, that, it, that is going to be there from the fact that there are issues about extremism on universities, university campuses. To what extent does paragraph 11 or paragraph 19 deter people from expressing themselves? I mean, the reality is that, as in lots of areas of life, but particularly university campuses, concerns about a reaction to what's said or done um, have an influence on people. Um, that doesn't flow from the guidance. That's just life. If a student uh, is concerned about holding an event about Palestine because they're worried about the reaction, that's not because of the guidance. And there's going to be guidance under primary legislation, come what may. Um, in relation to Article 10.2, moving on. We say that the, the judge is correct in his finding that uh, the, the guidance, uh, if, it, if it does interfere with Article 10 rights, it, it represents an interference that's prescribed by law for the purposes of Article 10.2. Uh, that's at paragraphs 96 to 110 the judgment and that to the extent that it it does interfere it's a proportionate interference and that's at paragraphs 111 to 151 so we say this is an area where the aim uh, for the purposes of article 102 the aim of uh, 
preventing people being drawn into terrorism is plainly a legitimate aim. Um, it's an area where the Home Secretary enjoys a wide discretion, where he is entitled to take a precautionary approach to um, uh, public interest considerations and to tackling the harm that can flow from um, terrorism and indirectly extremism that may draw people into terrorism. Um, the guidance has approval of Parliament by way of the affirmative resolution procedure. It is all about balancing... Where's that come, where's that come from, the analysis? That would be approved by Parliament. Under, under, under 10 to where's that come from, the analysis? In terms of considering, is this, a, supposing it were, an interference with Article 10, one rights, uh, the state enjoys a wide margin of uh, discretion, margin of appreciation when it comes to interferences with Article rights in the context of counter-terrorism, counter-extremism, um, in my submission, it is relevant that both Houses of Parliament, as well as the Secretary of State, um, have approved the guidance, and that that supports the proposition that it is, it is proportionate um, guidance that this court should be very slow to gainsay. And further important factor in, in my submission, if the guidance interferes with freedom of expression, it must be borne in mind the limited nature of the interference. It's not capable of impacting on what is taught, what members of staff say, um, it's not capable of impacting on what information students can access. An external speaker, in theory, uh, refused permission to give a speech uh, at a university, can give it by other means, can give it off campus, can give it over social media, can give it in private. Um, and that's the the Article 10 right, if there is one engaged, is the right of the external speaker. So the, the limit on them is minimal, in my submission. And as, as the judge repeatedly says, there's no right to go onto university campuses and deliver speeches to students. The guidance does not involve any criminalization or sanction or penalty. It has an emphasis on <coughs> challenge and mitigation uh, and promoting tolerance and that there should be reasoned public debate. And it's designed to protect a potentially vulnerable or suggestible group. You, you have, and I, I won't take you to or repeat it, you've got in our skeleton argument what, what we say about the Strasbourg authorities. Um, and I just want to highlight for you the particular passages um, that we rely on and refer to in, in the Carlisle and Core Issues Trust <coughs> cases. Um, so first, Car Carlisle, Lord Carlisle case, um, it's at Authorities Bundle 2, tab 31. the speech of Lord Sumption um, and the, the relevant paragraphs, if I could just give your Lordship your ladyship this, 
these. Um, so it's paragraphs 19 to 20 on proportionality, 22 to 26 on respect for the executive's judgment of questions of risk and harm, um, paragraphs 31 to 32 on the court not substituting its own judgment, 34 is the, the test of proportionality, um, and then finally 37 deals with Article 10 and paragraphs 40 to 44 um, discuss the, the degree of interference and the importance of assessing... I don't know how this fits in with everything. Let's assume that you fail on your, on your, on your paragraph 11. So this is nothing... I'm just trying to say that, that, that is... You say that's not featured in this part. Once you've got, once you've gone to on ground three, that that's all behind us. And what we're concerned with here is the alleged effect of the guidance on Mr. Buck personally. Is that is that what we're going to get to? Is it interference with his? Yes, he can't. Is it, is it that it's not the guidance now? It's the fact that he's been he's been. Now, I'm just trying to work out what the case is on thirty one two. Thirty one. On, on, on Article 10. On Article 10. Where he says that, and this is the only way he could formulate his case, that um, the issuing of the guidance was incompatible with his convention right to freedom of expression under, Artic convention. under Article 10. Yes. Um, he can't rely on anyone else's Article 10 rights. Um, so Section 6 of the Human Rights Act um, makes it unlawful for a public authority to act incompatibly with convention rights. Section 7 allows an individual to complain that an authority has acted incompatibly with convention rights, and it's section seven that imposes the victim requirement. Um, so it's only if he's a victim for the purposes of article 34 of the convention um, that he can, he can make that claim. Um, so our primary principle submission is he's not a victim. Of, his article 10 rights haven't been interfered with. The findings of fact of the judge about that, um, correct application of the victim test, um, that's the end of it. Suppose you were against us on that and you said, well, this somehow interferes with his Article 10 rights or for some reason he's allowed to pursue the claim. Then we say that whatever that interference is, it's prescribed by law and proportionate. My lady, this. If, 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 if it's successful on the ultra virus, then that's a different proposition. How, how is that? So, the, so the, the argument, the, the, the analysis is different. So, ground one, the argument is not the Secretary of State in issuing the guidance has done something incompatible with Article 10. Well, I follow that. It's so that's, that, that's, that's our argument. Yes, yeah, so it's that. Um, the Secretary of State has done something, and if this were followed, um, it, it may lead to something incompatible with convention rights. No, that's not, that's not it. Well, my understanding of, of the Vari's argument is that um, the guidance must be followed, and if it's not followed, uh, or no, the guidance must be followed, and following the guidance may permit or lead to or encourage a higher education institution to do something incompatible with convention rights. That, well, perhaps my learned friend I, I thought it was to do with the fact that, 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 that uh, uh, the vagueness and extent of non-violent extremism means that what's being proscribed, or potentially proscribed, pursuant to the policies, 
is a, it's outside the scope of the virus. Is that the uh, well, question? Well, the, the virus challenge, ground one, relates to the issuing of guidance which relates to extremism, including non-violent yes, extremism, yes, yes, yes. which we say goes beyond the yes. power to issue guidance in relation said. to section 26, yes. which is the duty to have regard to uh, preventing people being drawn into terrorism. We say extremism, non-violent extremism, goes beyond terrorism. Ground two is uh, an argument that the Secretary of State has exceeded his powers under Section 29 in issuing guidance because he has failed to have particular regard to the need to uh, protect the right of free, free speech, which is imposed upon him under Section 31.3. And it also relevant to that ground is the fact that there is a real risk of uh, breaches of free speech caused by the guidance, both by reference to the breadth of the definition of extremism and the direction in paragraph 11. Ground three is a freestanding uh, Human Rights Act challenge, which clearly has some overlap with ground two. But it's only under ground three that Mr. Uh, Buck, Dr. Buck needs to establish that he's a victim. But the, essentially... The victim, the, not by virtue of the prevent strategy, but by virtue of the guidance. By reference to three aspects of the guidance, the yeah, unclear, yeah. this is this is our, the note that I handed up this yeah. morning, the unclear and overbroad definition of extremism yeah. means that it lacks the quality of law required to be prescribed by law. That's the first aspect of it. The second aspect of, aspect of it is that the inclusion of non-violent extremism within it will necessarily authorise restrictions on free speech but that go beyond that, hate speech. How does that then overlap with the the ground and the ground one. It, it, it overlaps with ground two, two but not ground one. Perhaps we could hear. Sorry, my lady, yeah, I just, I, I just thought it might help if do I explained you, what you our case is. With ground two, but not ground one. Yes, it doesn't overlap with ground one. My understanding of, <laughs> of Melinda Friend's case under ground one is that there, there, that there, are, there are two limbs to it. There's what I've characterised as the macro challenge which is the challenge he's just outlined, which is saying that um, there's an elision of extremism and terrorism. It goes too, it's too broad. It goes yeah, further. Yeah, I think we all understand. Right. Also, there is the micro challenge to the particular wording of paragraph... Okay, that comes with the ground one. That's, that's not a ground one challenge. Well, my, my understanding is that that's ground is one. Is that a ground one challenge? No, no it's not a ground one. What, which ground is it? That is under ground two. The Secretary of State, in issuing the guidance, has failed to carry out uh, his or her duty pursuant to Section 29. You meet that by saying that's irrelevant because the Section 30, 30, 30 subsection 1, I think it is, I got that right, duty has nothing to do with uh, uninvited but potentially wanting to be invited people. That's how yes, you deal well, with That's how you address that. Uh, if that, I guess, now comes under, under ground 2, that's how I was understood. Because, because my understanding was that there was an Article 10 argument in there, which was saying that the paragraph 11 leads to, encourages, or permits. That is also true. A breach of Article 10. That is also true. But that's not Section 31.3. No. That is all. That's correct. So there are two. But, but, but I'm sorry. All I was saying was, insofar as there is a challenge by by resting on paragraph 11, it's not a ground part of ground one. Well, he's not, it's up to him. It's, it's up to him. Well, then, ground 1A, the paragraph 11 challenge, um, which isn't to do with section 31.3, but is to do with paragraph 11 leads to, encourages, or permits a breach of article 10, uh, which is my understanding of my lady's question as to how that interacts with ground 3. So whatever number it is, that argument... Um, is that my lady's question? It is. I mean, it says that the, the paragraph 11 is said to, it, in the construction that is put upon it on behalf of the appellant, said to lead to a restriction on, or a breach of Article 10. It's, it's ground two, my lady. Whatever ground <laughs> is, I, I ground X. Mind, but it, the question is, how does that interact with ground three? Well, the, the, the way in which it... it, it 
and as I come back to the point, in my submission, it's analytically different because ground three is saying the Home Secretary has done something incompatible with conventional rights herself or now himself in issuing this guidance. This guidance in and of itself is incompatible with Article 10. And then we have the arguments about victim status, prescribed by law, proportionality. The, the argument under in relation to ground X, the paragraph 11 argument, says that the Home Secretary has issued guidance which is unlawful because it needs to, permits or encourages the person having regard to it to do something unlawful, namely to act incompatibly with Article 10. Right, we really need to move on. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, the, so those were those were the passages I'm re referring to in the Carlisle case, um, and then the core issues trust case um, is the judgment of Lord Dyson, and this is uh, authorities bundle two, tab thirty five. Um, and ju just to give your lordship's your ladyship the, the paragraphs, um, it's 57 to 58 um, deal with prescribed by law and the scope for there being judgment on the part of the decision maker. Um, 60 deals with uh, the importance of protecting vulnerable individuals. 67 deals with the importance of reasoned public debate. The guidance obviously encourages challenge and, and uh, putting things in a, in a structure. Um, and then 71, um, 74 to 75, and 89 deal with um, the public sector of quality duty. And that, some of that's relevant because that's also a duty in terms of have regard to. Uh, and then 83 um, emphasizes the, the need to consider what is the degree, the severity of this interference? So you've gone 89 and 83. So 89, you said? Yes. And you've gone back to it. And you've gone back to it. It's a slightly different topic, really. Right. Um, so we emphasise that. Um, the Strasbourg cases, I will just leave your lordships. You've got our skeleton argument. The passages we refer to in, in the Strasbourg cases, uh, and we say that essentially that the, the judge was, was right in his, in his findings on that. Um, I... You have our position on the application to admit fresh evidence. I won't go into that. If I could just briefly turn around. And um, unless I can assist your lordship, your lordship any further, I, I'm very grateful for your, your patience and apologies for in my part in this in this overrun. Not at all. Right, now, Mr. Brown, I'm afraid I'm going to, and I don't usually do this, I'm going to use a time limit. Uh, I'm going to give you until um, 20 past 20 past five. And you'll just have to pay me your submission to court. Oh, my Lord, um, I'm, I'm very grateful for the opportunity, of course. Um, I say this, I, I'm not going to address you on the, if you like, the interpretation of the guidance, uh, paragraph 11. We keep, we have I don't think we need to, I need to understand you anymore with that. Uh, what I propose to do is to address you briefly in relation to uh, what our case is in relation to the prevent duty guidance, so that there's no, uh, no confusion about that. Uh, I'm then going to address you in relation to the realistic, uh, reasonable expectation of privacy point and the distinction that my old friend made with cat and his theatre um, metaphor. Yeah. Uh, and then I'll make a few submissions about uh, the section 43 interpretation. Um, but I'll, I'm certainly going to be finished by 20 past. Thank you. Um, can I ask your Lordship, uh, your Lordship and your Ladyship, to turn up uh, the outline submissions which you'll find in the core bundle at page 475. Just to 
my both sides again. If there's any skill is knowledge, it would be the first you wish to rely on. Please do send me your comments. Would you rather, my lord, that they came as Word documents or PDFs? What Word documents? Right, here's 475, my lord. 475. Our submissions. Yes, thank you. So, the sixth and seventh submission, although I'm confusing it up, or the seventh one proposition, but it's a submission. They relate to ground one, the original ground one. And they relate to the, uh, the fact, the, the proposition that the guidance goes further than drawing people into terrorism by referring to extremism and to the non-violent extremism. And we say either it's ultra-virus as a hard-edged issue, or applying the let's fox approach, uh, it's confusing and it will encourage education authorities to exceed their, uh, their remit under Section 26. Nothing to do with Article 10 and, and free speech. I mean, maybe that they'll do it by, that's how they will exceed their duties. But the point is that it, it is unclear and I am ambiguous um, by reference to the definition of terrorism, preventing people being drawn into terrorism. So that's ground one, those uh, two submissions, the sixth and seventh submission. The eighth submission br brings in ground, our ground two, which is the Secretary of State <coughs> exceeding his power under uh, his duty under Section 31.3 yes. to have particular regard to the uh, need to protect freedom of speech in universities. But it also brings into it uh, as part of that, uh, concepts of free speech as they've been developed under Article 10, because although the duty to have regard to free speech refers specifically to Section 43, of course free speech is protected not just by statute, but it's also protected by common law and it's protected by Section 10. But what we say under this submission is that those parts of the guidance that I've outlined are sufficiently confusing, given the, uh, the audience, that there is either a real risk that they will create uh, interferences with the right of free speech, or applying the fox lets approach, they're materially misleading, or they're not clear and um, unambiguous, and they will therefore make it more likely that there will be breaches of free speech. Now, for the purposes of that submission, Mr. Butt, Dr. Butt does not need to demonstrate that he's a victim of a breach of his human rights. He only needs to show that there is a real risk uh, and that he has standing. Uh, and we, and I, I refer so is that, to... So is that, so that, that is ground three as well, then? So that, that encompasses, in one respect, some of Ground 3, because Ground 3 is a straightforward, but, but it's probably safer to consider it as, a, as a, just Ground 2. And then Ground 3 is the area is when you need to consider victim status. But the, the reason why it bleeds into Ground 2 at this point is because it, it's invoking if you fail, free speech. If you fail under Section 31.3, yes. let's assume you fail under Section because, it, because Section 31.3, by reference to the 1986 Act, bears the interpretation uh, contended for by Mr. Saunders, assuming you lose on that, can you just articulate for us what is left in ground two? Well, is it then a breach? It's not a breach of a statutory duty. It's then a breach of a convention. Yes, so then we'd be invoking the Human Rights Act and also the common law uh, free right of free speech and the power of the courts to strike down guidance, non-primary legislation, to the extent that it uh, is incompatible with common law rights and under the Convention the Human Rights Act insofar as it's, as it's incompatible with convention rights. So, so Mr... Yes, yeah, so, I mean, w w what we say about the, the submission under Section 31.3, I might as well deal with it now. Yes, um, w what Mr. Saunders is saying is, is, well, actually, this is not a general right to free speech like you find under Article 10. It is only a right uh, uh, 
or it's only a duty to protect people once they are actually visiting speakers to make sure that they're able to speak. That's essentially what he said. And it doesn't encompass um, preventing somebody from being invited in the first place. And if they're never invited, then the duty under Section 43 never kicks in, in which case the Secretary of State can't be acting unlawfully uh, if he promulgates guidance that has the effect of preventing people being invited in the first place. That's what I understand his submission to be. So the first point to make is that he has misinterpreted Section uh, 43. Um, and I take that proposition from a, a case on Section 43 he didn't take you to, which is Mr Justice Seddy, as he then was, his judgment in the case of Rinneker. Can, can, can I just, just mention, this case was referred to below, uh, this justice seems to be refused to consider it because it's a commission decision with a non-authority. Well, let, me, let me show you, Your Lordship, and then I'm going to show you the statute. Uh, well, they're not, I mean, strictly, I, I think you can, I just have walked by it, but, but the, 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 the practice direction is quite clear on that. They're not supposed to refer to authorities which are, they don't bear any weight. I don't think, I mean, I mean they, don't, they don't carry any weight if it's a, if it's a commission application. And the short, point, the short point is we're not going to be influenced by that. We, we can One and order. Yes, say, so I'm pretty, you can persuade us otherwise, um, but not by reference to a permission decision. Well, what I'll do is, is, is I'll say this, that, that Mr. Saunders' submission, if it was right, yes. would mean that there's a fundamental contradiction between Section 31 and Section 43. Um, because the whole purpose of uh, Section uh, well, the whole purpose of Section 26 in the first place is to impose a duty on universities to have due regard for the need to prevent people being drawn into terrorism. Uh, guidance has been promulgated under that under Section 29, which directs universities to uh, take into consideration matters such as external speakers. And the guidance that's been given under Section 29 includes guidance as to the steps that universities should take in deciding whether to invite somebody or to allow somebody to be invited in the first place. Now, it's implicit, therefore, in that, that both Section 26 and 29 bring with, within them the power and the duty on a university to take steps to prevent somebody either from being invited in the first place or, from how, or to ensure that an invitation is withdrawn but on Mr. Um, Sorry, Mr. Them, <coughs> say, section 26 and 29 bring with them, bring with them the, both the power and the duty on a university to consider either taking steps to prevent somebody being invited in the first place or when an inv invitation has been extended, taking steps to, to ensure that is withdrawn. So it's implicit that Section 26, and therefore with it Section 29, apply to the decision whether to invite somebody in the first place. Include. 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 Yeah. Now, Section uh, 31, subsection 3, is a duty that the Secretary of State must take into account and must have particular regards to when promulgating guidance under Section 29 governing the way in which universities have to exercise their power and duty under Section 26. And if we just turn to Section 31 now, um, I will demonstrate how necessarily it must include the stage at which consideration has been given to inviting a speaker. So that's at tab two of volume one, yes. page 21 of the bundle. Yes. So if we look at section 31.2 first, when carrying out the duty imposed by section 26, subsection one, the specified authority to which this section applies must have particular regard for the duty to ensure freedom of speech if it's subject to that duty. Now, 31. 31 so this is the duty on, on, on the universities. Now just pausing there, it follows 
that I've demonstrated how in exercising their power under Section 26, their duty under Section 26, they had to give consideration not only to uh, whether to allow somebody to, give, to speak once they're already on the premises, but also to whether they should be invited or not in the first place. If Mr. Saunders is right, then subsection 2 would only apply to uh, that aspect of the Section 26 duty that the university would be exercising at the point at which a speaker was already on the premises. It would not govern... But, well, no, if they'd been invited, they haven't arrived yet. They'd be yes, invited. but it wouldn't, apply, it wouldn't apply to the process of deciding whether they should be invited or disinvited, yes. which is a necessary part of the duty under Section 26 and, and clearly falls into uh, part of the... Um, the duty under the, the prevent duty guidance. So then when we look at paragraph 31.3, the Secretary of State when issuing guidance under section 29 must have particular regard to the duty to ensure freedom of speech. It would also therefore follow that se the Secretary of State doesn't need to take, to have particular regard to freedom of speech as it applies to the inviting of a speaker in the first place or whether to have an invitation withdrawn. So again, he would only need to have particular regard to some aspects of the discharge of the Section 26 duty, but not others. Although both of them would, of course, <coughs> um, have uh, free speech implications. They'd certainly have common law free speech implications. So my first point is that it just it doesn't make sense if he's right, for the Section 31 duty to be split in, in the way that he suggests. But in any event, we say that Section 43 doesn't mean what he says it means, because the authority to which he took you, uh, the Caesar Gordon authority, uh, doesn't mean what, what he, he suggests and what it does mean. But if we go to Section 43, uh, I know your lordships have, and your ladyship have just seen it, but if we look at Section 43, Subsection 1. Which tab? Um, it's uh, tab 9, page 155. So two points to make, my lord. The first one is uh, visiting speakers um, at the end of paragraph 43. Uh, sorry, section 43, subsection 1, must be construed as meaning not only those who have already been invited, but those who are being considered for invitation. Well, it, depends on the, it all depends on the meaning of the word visiting speakers. That's what you're telling me. Yes. So, um, is visiting, does, the question is, does visiting speakers include people who have not actually yet been invited? Yes. So my, my my submission would be that it does, on a on a ordinary natural meaning of the word. But even if you were against me on that, my submission would be that you need to read section forty three one in accordance, firstly, with common law rights of free speech, and failing that, in accordance with rights of free, free speech under Article ten. That is to say, it must be read as including both uh, potential visiting speakers and visiting speakers themselves. That is to say, the university can't get around its duty in the first place, for example, by, setting, by giving an instruction to students saying, well, you can't invite this list of people to come and give uh, lectures in this university. Such a list, in my respectful submission, would be a breach of section 43, subsection 1. They said no politicians who have supported Brexit can be invited to this university, for example. That would clearly breach section 43, 1. And it's an unduly restrictive interpretation to suggest that section 43, 1 would only be brought into operation <coughs> at the point at which 
um, Jacob Rees-Mogg had already been invited, and the university turned around and said, well, you can't invite him. So that's, that's my submission, my lords and my ladies, on section 43. Thank you. Um, as far as... Uh, as far as the uh, reasonable expectation of privacy and the, the activities of the... EAU are concerned. Um, there's one important point to make in relation to the, the overlap, if you like, between these two cases. I started my submissions yesterday morning, however long ago that may now seem, um, by saying that at the heart of this case was the definition of government's definition of extremism. And the definition which we say not only uh, is breaches Article 10 because of its potential to chill free speech, but also that it is overbroad uh, and will therefore authorise interferences with private rights even for those people who are acting lawfully. Um, but there's an important distinction to make in this respect. Under the Prevent Duty Guidance, it's only extremism which uh, brings with it a risk of drawing a person into terrorism, but the EAU is not limited in that way. And the EAU, we know from uh, Mr. Willis's evidence applies the government's extremism definition, uh, which is the same definition of extremism, including non-violent extremism, but it doesn't require that the extremism brings with it the risk of drawing people into terrorism. Now, why is this relevant? Well, it's relevant for, for this reason, my lord. When the EU ma EAU made the assessment that Mr. Butt was an extremist, and they did so as I've demonstrated on several occasions. They made the assessment that he was an extremist by reference to the government's definition, not by, the defin by reference to the definition in the Prevent Duty Guidance. So they didn't assess him as being somebody who was, the, by virtue of his views, likely to draw people into terrorism. However, when the press release came out, he was one of six people who were given as examples of people who would no longer be able to go and speak in universities. Now, I don't seek to draw any forensic uh, conclusion from that. What I do, however, seek to demonstrate is to illustrate the problem with this definition and the problem as it applies in the prevent duty <coughs> is that that's exactly what everybody's going to do. If somebody is an extremist, they're not going to go on and ask the question, is this an extremist view that's likely to draw somebody into terrorism? They're just going to stop at the point that they've decided that he's an extremist. Because how on earth are they going to be able to know whether there's somebody who may or may not be uh, influenced by those extremist views? And essentially, my, my submission is this, that the, the <coughs> qualifier that it must come bring with it a risk of drawing a person into uh, terrorism is itself so vague and subjective uh, that it adds nothing, in fact, to the, the definition of, of extremism. Um, my Lords, as far as the gathering and storage of personal data is concerned, Mr Sanders made a submission. He said that the, the EAU doesn't keep a list of extremists. And, um, my Lord, it's, it's important to know that there's no evidence in, before you of that fact. There's no evidence that the EAU does not keep uh, a list of extremists. What there is is there's a letter from the uh, GLD, dated the 29th of January 2016, which says that. Okay. So there is something that says that. Well, it's a letter... It's a, it's a lawyer's letter. It's not, it's not a letter. From, from where, what's the reference to? It, it's, um, well, it's referred to at paragraph 177 of Mr. Justice Oosley's judgment. So if you turn to page 76 of the core bundle,
isn't the burden on you? Isn't the burden on, on, isn't the burden on you to show that there, that there is such a industry of property? Well, my lord, I, I, I'm about to explain or submit that it's obvious that in fact what the EAU does is is generate information which which is in, is indistinguishable from uh, a list uh, because we know that it, it collects uh, it collects information about people like Dr. Butt and you've seen the information that's contained in the subject access request. <coughs> so so my, my point is that it doesn't really matter whether there is or, or isn't a list. I just wanted to make the point that the evidence is only in a letter from the GLD, it's yeah. not in any of the statements. Um, and it's referred to in uh, Mr. Justice Usley's judgment at paragraph 177, uh, on page 76 of the call bundle, at the end of that paragraph, he says, in a letter on 26th of January 2016, the GLD said that the EAU did not designate individuals as extremists for others to investigate and never have ever produced or held a list of extremists. And my submission, my Lord, is a letter, a lawyer's letter, not evidence. Well, uh, uh, just uh, apologies for interrupting, but it, it's simply unfair to suggest that. We have a duty of candour in this case. We, I wouldn't let a letter like that s stay in the court's bundles if it was wrong. Well, there's also the statement at the beginning of paragraph 179 where the judge recalls what Mr. Willis said, um, saying it's obvious that the organisation keeps information about individuals and organisations well, right. who may or may not be associated with extremism. My Lord, I mean, that is the point. Is that, that it's, there's a curious, there's a curious uh, dichotomy between those two statements in any event, because what the EAU does is, of course, in, in substance, exactly what they say they don't do. And, there's, well, and, there, and there is a, in my respect, there's a mission problem. Well, anyway, what we know is that they get regular, what we can say, there must be common ground, is that the EAU, which is a group of individuals within the Home Office with a particular um, purpose, they receive information on a regular basis from students' rights. Uh, that information identifies people who are thought to have certain views and where they expose them, and those, not with a file, but on a particular name, but they are kept in the records of the Home Office. That, that we do know. That may not be a file. That's the point. And this may not be a file. And so the, the point is, we submit that they may well not have a file on Dr. Bud, but I mean they can do a search of the record. But the point is, my lord, is that what they're doing is in substance exactly the same. Right. Keeping they're keeping a, a record. You're saying they're keeping a, re a permanent record. Of people who are considered by them to be extremists. So they're also making that assessment in the first place. My Lords, you asked uh, Mr. Sanders how in practice uh, information might get from the EAU to a uh, prevent coordinator. Yeah. And um, there is in the bundles before you some, some university policies. Uh, I'm going to take you to one page in one policy to demonstrate how this happens in practice. Um, okay. you'll, you'll see some references in the note that I sent that I put before you to the Huddersfield Prevent Policy. Um, and I will ask your Lordship to, to look at this policy in more detail uh, in the calm and comfort of your own chambers. But I, if I could ask you, you think to they're either calm or comfort. <laughs> they must be uh, a great option. Well, my Lord, well, my I, room is comfortable anyway. I can't ask people anybody else's. I, I did once get in trouble for inviting a judge to look at something at their leisure. And I was told that they yes, we don't have leisure. Don't have leisure right. We don't have. Every moral advantage will be taken, Mr. Bowen. So why don't you just get on and tell us, take it away. Page 1087 of tab E, my lord. Which bundle? Bundle 3. Bundle 3. Bundle 3. It's, uh, it's uh, bundle page 3. Number, page it's page 1087, top, top of the page. 1087. This is the Huddersfield Prevent Policy. So I, I ask you, Lord Chips, to, to read this in due course, but yes. I should tell you that one of the steps that will need to be considered before the final decision is taken about an external speaker will include, or may include, and this is little c, little 2, referral to the regional prevent coordinator. So it won't necessarily be the first step, but it, it will be a step at some stage when a flag's gone up about a potential speaker 
the regional prevent coordinator will be consulted. Now, of course, we know that the EAU shares information with the uh, prevent coordinator, um, and therefore we know that um, the assessment that somebody is an extremist will be shared with the university. And, and my Lord, I'd ask this question rhetorically, is that it's suggested by Mr Sanders that not all of the information that the EAU hold will be passed to the university by the prevent coordinator. But of course it's the university that has to make the decision whether to invite somebody or not. They need to have as much information as possible for them to make a proportionate and lawful decision. And so it follows that they will need as much information as they can possibly get about an individual. So I'm suggesting, my lord, that it's hardly likely that all they're going to be told by the prevent coordinator is a name. And if that's all they did have, then they couldn't make a lawful decision. Um, my lord, in relation to the period post the press release, my submission yesterday was uh, we accept that there'd be no reasonable expectation of privacy in relation to the processing that followed uh, a request for whatever information the, um, uh, that the EAU had then. when it made its when it made the assessment that, that was in the, the press release. Yes. But I, I, I submitted that I didn't expect, <laughs> accept that that followed, that, it was, uh, that he had no reasonable expectation of privacy in relation to a further assessment particularly a further assessment that was taken in order to find out whether they'd made a mistake. And more particularly, all of that work, all of, the, all of the, that research <coughs> is permanently recorded in the EAU and is now held and is um, subject to the EAU's internal policies. That's to say it will be shared with other public authorities, other government bodies, uh, for the purposes of discharging the EAU's functions and the, the government's functions. So that assessment and that additional information, we respectfully submit, does bring with it a reasonable expectation of privacy. And there is no hard line that you can draw as at the 17th of September 2015. However, as I developed yesterday, it's our submission that the... Uh, information and the assessment and the uh, process that happened before the 17th of September was sufficient to engage a reasonable expectation of privacy in the um, Now, my lords, Mr. Sanders submitted just before lunch, and you, you, you looked at him um, uh, for a moment and asked if, you, if he'd like to go away and think about it again over lunchtime, why this case was distinguishable from CAT, part of paragraph 6. Why is this not public information. And his submission uh, is that it, because Dr. Butt had published it himself, then it could not be public information of the kind that, um, uh, that Lord Sumption was referring to paragraph six of Pat. He said he was on the stage rather than a member of the audience in the theater. Now I would accept as a proposition that if the information is something that you've put out there yourself, uh, rather than information about you that's in public, then it might be right to say that you would have less uh, of a reasonable expectation of privacy in relation to such information. And I'd be prepared to accept as a proposition that the fact that you were the speaker uh, at the protest with the megaphone, rather than somebody just in the, uh, on the sidelines, although Mr. Cap say I was in that case, it was not on the sidelines in any shape, way, shape or form, uh, but I can accept that as a proposition there may be less of a reasonable expectation of privacy in relation to uh, the information relating to the, the man with the megaphone. However, as soon as the state starts recording and storing that information for the purposes of assessing whether you are an activist or a an extremist or a subversive or a communist sympathizer or a remainer or a Brexiteer, particularly when it's for the purposes of, of uh, the exercise of a function which, which may prejudice you, then the distinction in my respect for submission falls away and, and uh, it, it's, 
it's not one uh, that you can read into cat sufficiently that you can distinguish cat from our case. And my lords, it's also inconsistent with uh, the defendant's, the respondent's own code of practice. I took you to the Ripper code of practice um, yesterday. Mr. Saunders has said nothing about his own code of practice. This is the Ripper code of practice that I took you to yesterday. Um, now, I granted, granted, my lord pointed out that it's a matter for you to decide <laughs> whether there's a reasonable expectation of privacy. But the fact that the uh, Office of the Surveillance Commissioner has produced uh, guidance, new guidance, which now specifically addresses the very issue that is before the court. Well, my learned friend suggests that it was not his client that produced it. Um, I believe it's Home Office guidance, but, but, but the Office of Surveillance Commissioners are responsible for um, anyway, it doesn't the production of it. But we can, we can clarify you, you, that. You say there's guidance. There's guidance. And that guidance has been produced to deal with precisely these circumstances. And uh, on a fair reading of that guidance, what was done in Mr. Buck's case clearly uh, would amount to private information. And in my respectful submission would also demonstrate that there was directed surveillance. Um, my Lords, uh, Mr. Saunders relies upon a series of cases, um, <clears throat> uh, the Krona Verlag case, the author of a blog case, the Mahmood case. Uh, my Lord, none of those cases have the factors that, we, that, that your Lordships are concerned with. Um, I accept that a person who enters the public arena, so for example, the fake shape case, the uh, Mahmood who was the, the son investigator who used to carry out stings, um, was photographed by a disgruntled victim of one of his stings and who, who then arranged for that photograph to be published. Uh, and um, Mr. Mahmoud, the fake sheikh, was unsuccessful in getting a, uh, a, an injunction restraining it. And it might be said that uh, the judge might have felt that what was good for the goose was sought for the gander. Um, but it doesn't take you anywhere with establishing whether there's a reasonable expectation of privacy in a case like this one. Um, and so uh, I respectfully submit that, that all those cases are uh, irrelevant. I've referred you to the W in the Secretary of State for Health case. Well, the clear distinguishing feature in that case was that there was, there was a notification. I took to paragraphs 42 and 43 of the judgment, and the, uh, that's the sharing of health information uh, for foreign uh, patients who haven't paid their thousand yes. pounds. Uh, and the court said, well, there's no reasonable expectation of privacy because you're notified in advance mm -hmm. of what's going to happen to your information. Well, that's right at the heart of this case, my lords. Uh, there was no notification. Yeah. Uh, if there had been, I wouldn't be here. Um, the uh, Magyar Helsinki Bezotstag case, which um, a learned friend also relies on, uh, again, I took you to yesterday, and uh, there were three particular features of, of that. Um, the public defenders in issue were, were acting in their professional capacity. Uh, they could have reasonably expected uh, what uh, use would be made of that statistical information, and thirdly, it was just statistical information. Um, and then the, going to have to finish in a minute. I, I, I'm going to, my lord, I'm just going to deal with the Galati case that my learned friend mentioned, Galati and MGN. That was a phone hacking case. Yes. Um, uh, and Lady Justice Arden does indeed re refer to the right to control personal information as being at the heart of Article 8. But that was in the context of, of deciding whether to make an award of damages. It was not seeking to introduce that as a concept into whether there is a reasonable expectation of privacy in the first place. My lords, my lady, there's plenty more I could say. Um, <laughs> what, I, what I suggest, uh, I hope that... Um, uh, well, I know you have got all that I wish to say in, before you in writing. Yes. Um, I apologise as ever for the, the weight of the material, uh, and I am sure that when you've carried out your, your task, you will think to yourselves, why do they put all this information before us? But we've done our best to put before you what we think we may need. Thank you um, very much. Well, we're extremely grateful to both councils. It's obviously an important thing case, uh, we will consider our judgments and um, the usual position applies uh, when we uh, 
circulating judgments in draft, that would be correct if it were grammatical <coughs> only. Uh, please agree upon an order. We won't need to have any further submissions orally any you wish to make will be in writing. Thank you both very much. Thank you.